Oh no, Kimbo, what happened? Whoa, no, it's fake. It's a scheme, it's a scheme. <sighs> don't, Excuse me. don't do this to me though, like. <laughs> May I help you? Oh, I really hope so. Okay, it's a scheme. Firm submitted plans for Mesa Verde Bank. We're building a branch here. In there we go. Things got really complicated, sorry. <sighs> Playing up the sympathy. Oh, I'll, I'll come around to you. Oh, good, thanks. Bless this lady. What a gem. Uh, your foot. Oh, uh, a sprain. Yeah, safer. It hasn't been that bad, except I have an eight-month-old, so. Uh, wants to change something then. She is, she's dialing it up. She's kind of banking that sympathy. They look the same to me. Great. Okay. You saved my life. My boss has, would have murdered me. Jimmy boy, okay. Second part of the- I mean, Everything's your fault, right? Mm -hmm. Mate, I'm here. I'm just ready. I'm ready to watch. Yo, Lizzie. Where's Aiden? Oh, hey, lady. <laughs> he's very hungry. Oh, he's the boyfriend, okay. Where's Aiden? He's fine. He's in the Wrangler. Just take a smell. Oh my God. You left my right. child in your Jeep? I cracked the window. Oh, man. <sighs> Amazing. Just trying to get her away, right? Help well, her. it's only been a minute. This lady's such a gem. Bless her. What am I supposed to... Trying to destroy them. Five minutes in a car. How okay. Strap myself in, right? I'm going to see what the play is. It's so interesting how... I, it's almost like I'm watching the show through Chuck's eyes a little bit. Because, like, looking at this and being like, Ah, Jimmy! You've sucked her into it. You've sucked her into your slipping Jimmy. Like, Kim is essentially, like, genuinely, genuinely compromised now. She, do you know what I mean? She's allowed herself. And she's... It's not just, like, he's... I personally wouldn't even say that he's manipulated her into it. It was her plan, right, with the pens. It was her idea to do this. He, he just did the legwork. And then he came afterwards and said, I'm so sorry, we don't have to do it again, we won't do it again, I know it could have got you in so much trouble, and it was her who said, no, let's do it again. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's very much she herself, her decisions, her decision making, by his involvement in her life, there is like this Chuck argument to be made of like, look at him corrupting those closest to him, right? I was only alone for a minute, thank God. <laughs> Oh, and it's gonna be a thing of like, look, just let me give you these. They're the same plans, it's no big deal, but there's something different. Something's been changed in the plan, I wonder. I am so sorry. Oh my God, oh my God. They played it perfectly. Kim's played this, look at Kim. This is what we're gonna do, this is what we're gonna do. It's gonna be her plan. She's You're gonna, gonna give me your copy. She's, oh my God, this is such a genius plan. And, and, and Kim playing this perfectly, by the way, committed to this. Exactly the same, no one has to know. Right. My God, come on. Okay. If What's going to be different? Is it going to be some level of permission that they should have got, that they couldn't have got or didn't have, and that is going to say that they have, and it's going to be official because it got past a check, I guess. It, it probably got past like a, a couple checks or something, like people have been look, looking out. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you so much. Mate, this is spicy. This is getting spicy, dude. I'll tell you how much this means. A to new me. one. Really. <gasps> Being a mom is hard enough. Bless her. Yeah, fair play to you, mate. This is the thing. This is my fear of her getting caught and getting in trouble here. Damn. Stamp. But I'm like, how do you catch him? How do you catch this? Do you know what I mean? Uh, <laughs> Hello and welcome to another Better Call Saul Sunday. That's right, we are doing season four, episode nine today. Vida Sane. I think that's how you spell it. I'm pretty sure that's that word. We shall find out. Yes, my tie is in the wash, okay? Just like, let it go. Let it go. <coughs> ah, let's see what Lalo's made of, shall we? Again, I think there's an edge to him, right? What are you taking in that water? I feel, I just sense. Yeah. Oh, Hector? Is Hector here? You don't like her bow? Mmm. With Dan and goodness with me. Was he? I feel like that's a lie. Se tomó su tiempo con él. That sounds more like Hector, yeah. Regresé ese día. <laughs> sí, ya sé que fue muy estúpido, pero... Yeah, it's interesting just this calm conversation between Lalo and Hector. There's not much, like, this isn't big. It's not some big bloodbath, some horrible act that Lalo is perpetrating. But I think the ease and the glee. Look at his face here. 
like Lalo's face as he is recounting these very awful things, burning all of this, this man's things. I, I assume doing horrible things to his wife and to the man himself. And look at the glee, the way that he's using this to butter Hector up, make him feel better. And the ease with which he talks about it, I think that shows you a lot about who Lalo is. And it speaks to, I think that edge that I just felt like he had. The, his introduction last episode is so cool because it's very cordial. It's very cheerful, very, very uh, warm. He's cooked something for Nacho and it's arguably nice. He seems, seems like a nice guy but he I, I don't know what it is I don't know where it's probably a combination of things but like whether it's the actor's performance whether it's the fact that he's a Salamanca probably like I say a combination of all those things where I think you watch that and you're reading that as the audience and you're like oh this guy's dangerous and so that's kind of the sense that you get with him this kind of surface level warmth but on the surface there's something darker and I think this conversation kind of carries that on oh god Right, there it is. Wow. Oh, I mean, I'm not that surprised, but it's kind of wild that this bell is steeped in so much, I feel like, horror and blood. And the reminder, the sentimental value that it holds and the reminder of that. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. What a horrible symbol. Right, the representation of it. Iconic. <laughs> Alright, that's enough, mate. Let's just chill out, you know what I mean? Go get some jello. Yeah, he's losing power again, isn't he? Hablemos del chileno. Right. Uh, that's, that's rude. Same old Hector. Just wants to kill everybody. Amazing. This time next week, I will once again be James McGill Esquire. Mm. Unexpected bonus of the drop phone business. It's great for client development. Beautiful. Of course, they all know me as Saul Goodman. Keep it going. For the old Yule Babino treatment, our powers combined. You know, as much as I feel like this is finite, because this is waiting to blow up, right? That's the sense I get. It's lovely seeing them like this again. It is. I'm a sucker. I am. I'm a sap. I do. I like it. I do. People would pay top dollar for us to undo a potentially life-ruining sentence. I'm trying to... I think we should only use our powers for good. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah, I was reading. It's, it was so hard to read her face there. I was reading a little bit of reluctance, but also maybe temptation as well. What a subtle expression from her. She is so good at that. People would pay top Look at dollar it. for us to undo a That's kind of like waiting, like, no, I'm not sure, like... And then there, 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 the look. And I know she says, I think we should only use our powers for good. But I think there's a little, there was a little splash of temptation at the end. What are we considering good? We'll know it when we see it. Fair enough, but she's in. Putting a little bit of a, a breaker on it though. Like keeping it in check a little bit, which fair play. We just drove 300 miles to scam Lubbock. Mm -hmm. So that your client can have a 13% bigger bank branch. Don't get me wrong, I loved every second of it, but. How moral is that? How is that using our powers for good? Yeah. Good question. Maybe don't question it though, if you want to keep this. Okay, fine. Yeah. Well, no, we see it. I, I like it. It's a plan I can get behind. <sighs> yeah, yeah, and then look, look, yeah, she holds his hand again. It's not healthy from his perspective to be acting so quickly, avoiding questions that are valid, behaving in a way that is completely almost deferential to how she feels and how she, no, not, not, not how she feels, how she takes it, how she takes what he says. That's not healthy. Because <sighs> the context in which he asked that and backed down was very much, it's not important as long as we're together. I don't want to like jeopardize it. It's difficult, isn't it? It's difficult because it's like, it doesn't really matter. It's a valid question if you want to go that way. If you really want to question her, I don't think he necessarily does. I think it was just Jimmy just being Jimmy. It just, it seems like a relationship based on something a little bit flimsy right now. He's willing to do whatever he has to, not ask questions wherever he needs to, to give in to her whims almost. Do you know what I mean? Because that is a whim, the Lubbock thing wasn't for good that was very selfish from her perspective that was a whim of hers Do you know what i mean so yeah yeah i i just i still see the cracks in their relationship it's just cracks in a slightly different way this still feels flimsy as a foundation for their relationship unfortunately why do i feel like someone's gonna get blown up man Vida saying. What is Vida saying? Is it goodbye? See you again. We have a small problem. I go in and check. No, send someone else. It's my job, Michael. Why do I feel like he's gonna boop? 
You know what I mean? I don't like it. I don't like how we're lingering, man. I really don't. Uh, it falls apart if he's gone, man. Morale absolutely tanks. The, but the, the, the show might be playing me. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if the show's playing me. Building the tension. Or building the tension. And then he's going to be like, all good. Do you know? Mate, no trust. <laughs> In this moment, I actually honestly don't know if he's going to make it out or not. I don't know what they're going to do. They could do anything. They could do either. Huh? What's going on? What's going on? I actually... What's happening? You okay? It's just scared because it's, well, it's dynamite, right? I mean, fair. This isn't putting me at ease, though. Okay, sorry, fair enough. I, the risk, I suppose, is uh, higher, maybe, than I was expecting. Fair enough, dynamite, right? I just, he's the leader, man. Do you know what I mean? Send someone else. I also like him. I don't know any of the others, do you know what I mean? Like, selfishly. Send someone else. Mate, I was so scared for him then. I thought there was some, like, gas or something or something. I don't know. I do feel as if because we've acknowledged that he's scared and shaking that he's gonna be okay. <sighs> You've got it, you're fine. Oh, I'm not relaxing. How's just not my Okay, okay. I don't like this shot. I don't like it. I don't like how it's been shot, I don't like how it's played. All green. Mm. On the go. Oh, they mask in the sound with something else. So it's not suspicious. Mikey boy sees it, yeah. One. Maybe there's some ulterior motive from Werner. Oh, it masks the sound. All okay? Yeah, Mike, have a talk. Oh wait, we're missing one. We're missing uh, one. I Oh, good, yeah. No, I'm good, thank you. No! Fair enough, I get it, but also... You can't be always on duty, Mike. <laughs> One of the lads, mate. Mike, 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 the drift. Yeah, a drift with all that. You've been away before. Is of course not like this. Mm. I finished what I've started, no question of that. But you're struggling. I can't help but wonder. Bring her here. Kai could supervise at work until. Right. You're talking about flying to Germany for a weekend. Just a quick trip. And when the boys find out that you did that, I mean, maybe they like him enough that it's like, yeah, you go. It's also worth noting that knowing how this episode ends, I wonder at how much Werner's nervousness is inspired by Mike communicating last episode what the situation is and how much danger Werner's in if he messes up or angers Gus. When it's done, from the money you've made here, you'll never be retire. Never be away from your wife again. Mm hmm. Of course. I just feel like the way that he thinks, I don't like this. This makes me think that the point of contention or the point of maybe rebellion is going to come more from Werner than Kai, right? Which is interesting considering obviously what we've seen so far. I mean, we've seen kind of all of his inclusion, Werner's inclusion in the show, how passionate he is about architecture, right? And we saw that last episode specifically as well in the bar. Just just the, the thing that Mike said about the money and you'll never have to like worry about it again. You'll never have to be parted from your wife again. You'll, you know, I think from the money they're being paid, they're probably, he's probably going to, like if he wanted to he could probably retire i just think that from what i've seen of him it's all about the passion i don't think he's the kind of person that could just okay i'm done now i don't have to work anymore do you know what i mean he seems like the kind of person who's so in love and passionate about his job that he would still keep doing it anyway do you know what i mean so it's like i just the way that mike kind of talks there of trying to talk him down i don't think it's the boon that mike intended it as i don't think it's as much of a persuasive influence on Werner as it it, it should have been do you know what i mean and so it makes me wonder actually yeah like i say where maybe the rebellion is going to come I'm from actually and maybe it's more so Werner than than Kai or any of the others we'll get you on the phone with her for an extra call thank you my friend beautiful is that enough yeah Mike's worried you hang in there Mike's worried I think it's one of the guys that you know made all the trouble last year Nacho 
I see. Nacho gonna tell him about Lalo. I thought that you wanna know. Oh, thank you, Lyle. Bless you, Lyle, mate. Oh, I love him. I do. Oh, it's literally Lalo, right? Okay. This is the best chicken. Wow. I have ever had. I feel like that's big from him, you know, chef that he is. It's crispy, but it's not dried out. That is kind of perfect, yeah. But is it possible for me to meet the owner? I am the owner. <laughs> Perhaps we should go to my office where we can discuss it further. Excellent. Don't waste that. Uh, <laughs> I like him. <laughs> yeah. No, do you know what? It's interesting how this show, and I think Breaking Bad as well, coming into that, characterizes its villains so originally. Like, they all kind of feel different. If you think of, like, Gus, Nacho, Hector, Don Lario, Lalo now, even Walter, Tuco, all of them are very distinct, very different. And Lalo's got another kind of personality to him. It's, it's this kind of, like I say, this very jovial, warm, kind of almost goofy, right? The way that he just got off from the chair there, and the way that he talked and the way that he was about the food while also i feel like we've not really seen it yet we've sensed a little bit obviously at the beginning of the episode with his conversation with hector of this edge this violence this very dark side to him it's there it's definitely there but we haven't really seen that not properly not overtly i wonder whether we're gonna get i think because the salamancas do feel very superior to gus right and i feel like we're gonna get that here i think there's gonna be like a little bit of lalo pulling rank here because i think lalo does see himself as above gus but um anyway just just a note, just a note on the differentiation of the characterizations of the villains and how they're all distinct, which is really impressive, considering how many of them there are and how interesting that all, they always are as well for that. And it's impressive that they all do feel distinct, considering how frequent that sort of character is in these shows. I've been an admirer of yours for many years. Really? I wouldn't put it past him being truthful there, actually, as well. To give you our deepest thanks for saving Don Hector's life. Mm -hmm. It was a simple instinct. With all the history between you two, hmm. what you did was a gesture of peace. Fair enough. I can imagine that would be why it's possible. They, they would see it that way. And here we are, getting along. Okay. Una vez te has puesto a pensar que ese Don Eladio es un cabrón. Interesting, an alliance. ¿Te gusta esta mala leche entre nosotros? Is he going to try and unite with Gus against Eladio? Mientras tus camiones son los que mueven el producto, Los Salamanca son los que lo protegen. Fair enough, okay. Pero que más llamada leche. It would be so much more interesting to see Gus have to back away from this and the the intricacies of navigating this conversation. That's, yeah, interesting. I am satisfied with the current arrangement. I'm just sh you. Mm. If you need a favor, I'm your man. Interesting. And I'll be back for that chicken, eh? It's too tasty to stay away from. He's got charisma. He's likable. Yeah. Yeah, but that was so dangerous and I think Lalo was getting his measure and I think equally gave Gus his measure, right? What an interesting interaction because that's a very non-interaction almost. At face value, nothing happened there. It was very, do you know what I mean? But I do feel like Lalo was testing the water a little bit. Like it's very in character for the Salamancas to want to oust Don Eladio. We saw Hector doing that or, or showing a little bit of a desire to do that. Not recognizing perhaps the hierarchy and obviously we, we're not privy to a Lalo and Hector conversation, you know, at the beginning of the episode. So we don't know what happened there either, right? So Hector might have communicated that to Lalo. That might be where Lalo's at too. So yeah, you know, the, the I'm just messing with you thing from Lalo. I don't think he was. I think he's, you know, like I say, dipping the toe in the water, getting the measure of Gus, seeing where he is, reading that. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I feel like a very subtle conversation, but I think a conversation that does more than what we got at face value. Really interesting character in Lalo. And like I say, so charismatic, so likable. Gus obviously taking his measure and like, I think recognizing what I do in that there is that edge below right below the surface but he's so interesting like me as an audience member just watching him as a character i what I, I quite i like him knowing as i do that he absolutely there's a horrible monster under the surface i i just i i know that i just feel like there is but i still like him from from the moment of his first introduction last episode and the way that he approached nacho lovely lovely i think that's what the word i said i, I was like lovely every conversation every interaction he's had he's been kind of lovely the the mask slipped a little with hector and i and i'm sure we're gonna see some other stuff going forward but yeah interesting character it's too tasty to stay away from but yeah gus is a player and a uh, game recognizes game go on he's got a chicken farm way out of town show me mm, he's an issue isn't he 
Don't you litter. Don't you do it. I knew it. I knew it. Why did I know? As small as that little detail is of him throwing the cup out of the car, I think it tells you a lot about him. And it, I think it is a nod, like I say, to something subtle under the surface that is a little bit more nefarious. Bear in mind, they don't have to do anything in these shows, right? Like, you know, it's the same thing as like, you don't put coughs into conversation. You didn't have to put that, him throwing the cup out of the car at the end of that. They could have just driven off. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, it was just specifically a hate, either scripted or, you know, told to the actor, you know, before the scene, throw the cup out of the car. It's very very specific, very on purpose, not by accident. And I do feel like it is, like I say, these subtle tells as to his character, as to his person. And like I say, as much as he's charismatic, likable, there's something under the surface. And last episode, this episode, we're subtly seeing hints of that monster under the surface. I think the Hector conversation, that little thing, as small as it is, obviously the Salamanca name as well. It's just, you know what I mean? It's kind of beautiful how they are just kind of like breadcrumbing that a little bit. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's lovely. Today the day. You get it back, mate. He says he was impressed with your commitment. Hmm. Says here you were a part of something called the Silver Circle. Three months in a row. Sales award. Yeah, they didn't clock it, but he was exceeding expectations. I would say it's given me a new outlook on client relations. <laughs> Not a lie. Well, as the saying goes, the law is constantly changing. It's interesting. The law is constantly changing. If you such an interesting thing to throw in there as a line. Because again, I think of Chuck, and that's not very Chuck, is it? Oh, or is it? I mean, what was his line? The law is the law. And that line goes against it. The law is ever changing. And it's so interesting, the environment that he's throwing that line into in, in the context of the show. You know, Chuck's the law is the law. And that line goes against that. The law is ever changing. It, it combats Chuck. It combats Chuck's outlook, or at least the outlook that he had specifically with Jimmy. And again, I feel like almost the show pointing out actually, yeah, how unfair Chuck was to Jimmy when he was alive and the years in which, you know, Jimmy was obviously trying to better himself. And, you know, you can look at the motivations of Jimmy for wanting to become a lawyer and everything. And we've looked at that. And, you know, I've looked at that in videos, obviously previous to this. But I think when you look at, you know, someone like this guy and he's throwing out lines like that and how that's a perception. Again, it just kind of throws into stark contrast how strict Chuck was and how, how toxic Chuck was and actually how he wasn't the pinnacle of the law, perhaps. I mean, there's an argument you can, you can make that Chuck is a better lawyer than this guy. I don't know what this guy's jurisdiction is. He clearly has something to do with the law. I don't know if he's a lawyer in his own right, whether this is just his job. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. But I think it's probably safe to say that Chuck didn't have the monopoly on the way that one must perceive the law, right? And I mean, this is what I've been talking about all, all series, right, all throughout the show, of this idea of the law isn't as sacrosanct as Chuck made out to be. You know, you can get into the nitty gritty of it and, and talk about maybe that's why Chuck was as good as he was because that's how he treated it. And, you know, that's what made him maybe as good as he was because he would look at obscure law to make him win all of these cases. And that's maybe why he was a, a good lawyer as well, right? I'm not saying that that didn't work to his benefit, but it didn't work to Jimmy's benefit in the sense of how empathetic it made Chuck towards him. And it's so interesting, sorry, that law line, as small as it is, as throwaway almost as it is, how it does combat what we've been told by Chuck, right? And how, do you know what I mean? And just the story that we've been told and how it's been presented in the characters we've had telling the story to us and how this guy just comes in and just kind of almost dismantles that. And it's like, you're kind of like flippantly reminded of the, the way that Chuck didn't give Jimmy any kind of leeway. You've been keeping yourself uh, apprised of the latest developments. You know what caught my eye recently was Crawford v. Washington. And if you can follow that, how did it go? The only indicium of reliability sufficient to satisfy constitutional demands is the one the Constitution actually prescribes confrontation. It's classic Scalia. So interesting I mentioned Chuck. He, he, is this too far? I want to say he's almost reminiscent of Chuck in this moment. Like, obviously he's done his homework, but that's obviously, again, uh, you know, doing his homework, very reminiscent of Chuck. It's so interesting how that line by that guy, and I've just gone on a whole thing about it, elicits Chuck. It makes me think of Chuck. And then it's funny how, like, obviously I'm, you know, that's where my mind goes and the way that that line throws you. And the way that Jimmy then almost embodies Chuck in the way that he is. He, like, that's very Chuck-esque in that, you know, he's, he's maybe referencing, uh, not really an obscure, 
pure thing. I mean, he mentions, Jimmy mentioned in the bar journal, right? It's very topical. These guys know about it too. But almost this thing that Chuck would do of, you know, he would do that thing where he would he would bring up obscure facts. He would like quote stuff. He would be like word for word for word, right? And look at look how Jimmy reacts to Latest this. Latest developments? Latest developments in the bar journal. You know what caught my eye recently was Crawford v. Washington. Very Chuck. And if you follow that... And if you follow that, almost Chuck-esque in the way that it's kind of condescending. It's it's not a face value, but subtly kind of can be if you know the person. And Chuck would do that thing. I pointed it out a lot during the show where he would say something and it was very subtly condescending. Just just because I knew Chuck and, and how he saw people and how he kind of said things. And if you follow that, there's almost an expectation that they haven't been. And it doesn't really matter if they have or not. You're going to tell them about it anyway, right? That was kind of very Chuck-esque. It, do you know what I mean? And, and there's something in the way that Jimmy says that, that's very Chuck-esque. And then that he was starts... The Supreme Court case, wasn't it? That's right. Yep, How did that's it right. The only indicium of reliability... Then he starts quoting... Constitutional demands is the one that Constitution very Chuck. actually prescribes confrontation. This feels like Chuck. It's classic Scalia. It's classic Scalia. Feels like Chuck. This feels like Chuck. He's channeling Chuck. I'm sorry. I just... I get rolling on constitutional questions. Short answer. That's so very Chuck. Because Chuck would do that. I'm sure there's moments where Chuck's done that in the show as well. Where he's got on a roll and he's quoting. And then he stops himself and he's like, I'm sorry, I'm getting carried away. Blah, blah, blah. You know, it, so interesting. How he's, and, 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 and how ironic. How like, how much would Chuck be rolling in his grave if he knew? Like, because Jimmy's almost channeling Chuck to get himself back into the law again. How almost like poetic it is that Jimmy is kind of channeling Chuck to overturn almost Chuck's best efforts to make sure Jimmy never practiced law again. There's something like beautifully poetic about this moment and the way that Jimmy's playing it, the way that he's hearkening back to Chuck, the way that he's talking and the way that Chuck would hate it. Absolutely hate it. I feel like, I feel like, I don't know if there's going to be a moment after this where he maybe confirms this, but I feel like before he went in here, he was like, what would Chuck want to hear? How should I talk in a way that would best almost persuade Chuck? Because that's kind of who he's talking to now. Do you know what I mean? Obviously, day without the benefit, perhaps, of Chuck's history with him that would make Chuck not believe Jimmy in this moment, but they might. Mr. McGowan, what does the law mean to you? Interesting. The law. Go on. Uh, yeah. Okay. Don't tell me that's throwing you. Come on. Listen, growing up, becoming a lawyer was uh, the last thing on my mind. Mm, maybe a bit of honesty. I didn't have the smarts or the skills or the stick to itiveness. Right. I happened to get a job with some attorneys, and I couldn't help but think maybe I could do that. And why not? Something inside me made me want to try. Do you not know what that was? Because I think we do, don't we, as the audience? I think we... There's a case to be made that it was Kim. I mean, I've talked about it in, what, I don't know, two episodes, three episodes ago with that flashback. Maybe he doesn't know what made him trigger that thought. University of American Samoa Law School. I wish it said Georgetown. Mm. I wasn't a natural. It shouldn't matter. Trying to pass the bar <laughs> practically killed me. I must have quit. 10 or 12 times. But you kept going. But I kept coming back to it and I'm... Yeah. Our legal system is complicated and sometimes it could feel capricious, but it's the... Mm. But it's the closest thing to real justice that we've got. And for it to work, it needs vigorous, passionate advocates. Interesting, isn't it? Helping my clients, arguing on their behalf, that's the best thing I've ever done. I think he's been truly honest here. This past year, I missed the hell out of it. I think he's being so honest. I this is this is genuine, I think. Ah, it's hard to tell with Jimmy, isn't it? Like in the way that we've watched him and the way that we've watched him fake tears and everything. I wanna believe him. I'm not sure. I wanna believe him. I'm not, I'm not sure. Do you know what I mean? Like it's that kind of thing. And it's interesting though, I do feel like whether you wanna talk about how much of this is him just putting it on, how much of it is truth, I think you can safely say that like there's at least a decent amount of it that is true. It's interesting the word he used, the passion, the rigorousness of like arguing for the client. That was kind of his argument. That was the way that he focused it. And what was it? I'm gonna go back. Hang on. I don't know. I wanna say that it's like on purpose that they were eliciting the idea of Chuck in the way that the, the script was written here and the, the way that the scene was played. And I do feel like it's almost like throwing Chuck and Jimmy up here. I mean, like the law, the law is kind of the conversation and we got Chuck and we got Jimmy and we're kind of throwing like, he was telling Chuck, right? And they love that, they ate that up and that works too. That is a lawyer that is valid and fair to be, right? But then I think we almost get in this conversation here, Jimmy, Jimmy here and, and, and 
and the, the lawyer that he can be and the, the lawyer that he is. And I think the way that he talks here does personify the way that we've seen him interpret and practice the law. Because when I got to work with actual, actual clients, clients, there was nothing else like it because he is very client based do you know what i mean he's not so much like chuck is the law is the law whereas i do feel like jimmy has always been focused a lot on the clients right he's always cared about people even if that means breaking the law and, and like skirting the rules to make sure that person gets what they should get our legal system is complicated, complicated. And sometimes it could feel capricious yeah the closest thing to real justice that we've got and he's right. It's the closest thing. It's the only, it's like, it's the only thing that exists that is going to get you closer to the justice that you might deserve. And I think he believes that. And I think that's true. And for it to work, mm -hmm. it needs vigorous, passionate advocates. Yes. It's that vigorous, passionate advocates. And, and I believe him. And I think that's what he means that. And I think that's absolutely, that sums him up as a lawyer. So I think, I think this like almost this mask of Chuck falls and he's honest here. And I think that is valid. The way that he's talking is valid. And it's so interesting how I think he's almost talking for his version of practicing the law in the sense of, because it is a very real conversation you could have, isn't it? Of is the way that Jimmy conducts himself in that he skirts rules, in that he does things to get things done. If he knows that the person and deserves to get the thing or win the, the case, right? Because that's kind of where his intentions lie, right? He might skirt the rules, he might break the law while working within the law, right? Because that's different. You can like simultaneously work within the law while also breaking it. And and Jimmy's proven that. Don't get me wrong, if he's caught doing it, he's gonna get in a lot of trouble. We've also seen that. But it is almost this philosophical question of, okay, the law exists. Sometimes it doesn't always, it's, you know, it's capricious. And I think that's almost a mention of like, like some, some of the things I've been talking about. And, and Jimmy's mentioned too, throughout the show, of the law doesn't necessarily favor everybody. Don't get me wrong, it's all we have. So that's what he's saying too. We've got to kind of work within that. But is it necessarily, I think almost the question unsaid is, is it necessarily immoral to go outside of that sometimes to get the best result for the person, the client? Because that's what I mean. The focus he's talking about is on the client. And I think there's something very human, very valid, something that you can, as the audience, connect to. Because I think so often you hear these cases of, of, you know, I mean, you know, the law exists as, as it does. And sometimes it is that, you know, the rich don't suffer for it. The more money you have, the, the less the law applies to you, for example. And sometimes the way that, you know, different lawyers might argue something means that the person that should get the, the good result doesn't. And what Jimmy does as a lawyer is that he assures that the person, and I mean, you know, that's not, that's imperfect too. It's like, well, Jimmy, how do you know that they're absolutely, truly innocent, right? I, I think we've seen that the people perhaps that he has fought for have been deserving of it. I mean, I think the most you can say is that his intent is in the right place. And so it's that question of like, say philosophical almost of, is he wrong to sometimes go outside of that to make sure that the person that should get the result they should get gets that result, even if it skirts outside the law. Like I say, he's working within the law while also perhaps sometimes breaking it. Is that the worst thing in the world? I mean, look, again, this is a very contextual example. What I'm talking about sets a very dangerous precedent because then it just means that people with power, lawyers, if you kind of say, oh, well, it's okay if you deem it's okay to go outside the rules of the law, then, then it's anarchy. Like I say, this is very contextual to Jimmy. And the, the person that I know he is, and I do think as much as he he has failings and he does and as much as he's gone outside the law and as much as perhaps sometimes it's been selfish and that's not good I do think truly he is like there is a good person in there I mean again like you know I think when we get to Breaking Bad and Saul the Saul that we see there there are absolutely and I think we're seeing that transition he you know the Jimmy Saul that we're getting in the show I, I think now in season four is kind of paving the way there obviously where you know we're seeing that and I think the the Saul that we get in Breaking Bad is very much much more cutthroat harder to defend right than perhaps the Jimmy that we're getting to know in this show but it is interesting again how we see his particular brand of lawyer which I do feel like to a certain extent is is very valid too alongside like I say this conversation of the law Chuck Jimmy is very valid too alongside Chuck's also valid way of, of practicing the law, right? Obviously, you know, look, we could get into the, the precedent that I'm talking about, the dangerous precedent that sets. And again, it's something you can't say generally. And I'm not saying generally that, you know, Jimmy's 
way of doing it is good. What I am saying is that contextually, specifically to Jimmy, you could argue that it's good because we know Jimmy and we have a lot of context and a lot of information that we wouldn't ordinarily have if we were judging this in real life, right? I've talked about this before of how privy we are when we're watching a show of all of this information we wouldn't ordinarily have. So you can judge the show and the characters in the show more so than you can, you know, real life examples because in real life we don't have the information we have. We don't have fly on the wall. We don't don't have a camera looking in on private moments and intentions and motivations and you know we don't know these people whereas in a show we do you know what I mean so it's a, it's a different conversation whether you're talking about it in a, in a, in a show or, or in a general sense because I think in a general sense it's a very dangerous precedent to set anyway I've waxed lyrical enough but I do think this scene is so interesting it's almost like on the surface it's nothing again it's, it's that thing of on the surface it's nothing the Lalo and Gus thing on the surface it's nothing happening but it's very subtly kind of harkening back to the character characterizations of the people what we know of them and there's more under the surface right and I think there's a lot going on here he's channeling Chuck and then he kind of dips into himself and the honesty and how I think actually there's an argument a really strong argument to be made that he himself as a lawyer the way that he does things as much as he skirts things that with the system imperfect as it is that he's valid in that right maybe not the soul that we see in Breaking Bad and maybe not the soul that we're gonna see as we go through the show but as he is or has as he had been maybe Maybe. Like I say, philosophically, as a general question. Helping my clients, you know, arguing yeah. on their behalf. That's all. That, that's kind of all that mattered to him. The best thing I've ever done. And I think he believes that. I think that's truth. That was very eloquent. Mm. Was there any particular influence on your views? Maybe even Chuck. Um, in the way that Chuck was, in the way that he... Credit where credit is due. The University of American Samoa. Okay. Go land crabs. It was here! So you're gonna see me come to conclusions as to where they read his insincerity. But re-watching this in the edit, it was this moment here. He's about to say Chuck and backs off, filling Chuck's name in with a lie that you can tell is a lie by the way he delivers it. It's forced, fake, and the almost perfect showing he gave is undermined by this false show of enthusiasm. I want to it say is. that that question, where was the influence from? I want to, uh, as close as he was to Chuck, I want to say that there was probably some influence from Chuck, even if it was like he saw how Chuck did things and he didn't want to be that. You know what I mean? He didn't want to be cold. He didn't want to be calculated. He didn't, he didn't want to just be a lawyer for its own sake, for the law. He wanted to help people. Almost be the lawyer that Chuck could never be. I'm reaching. I am I'm absolutely reaching. You can absolutely argue against what I just said. I'm taking some liberties a little bit. I do think there's an argument to be made. Though. And I, and I do like that. I, I I like that as a as an influence almost. Do you know what I mean? Like looking at Chuck as much as he respected him. I absolutely because he respected him. But I think there was probably something subconscious in the way that Jimmy saw how Chuck was. He wanted that, but in a, in in his own way. And I think there was probably some level of Jimmy, even if he didn't acknowledge to himself, that didn't necessarily once he got to that point, didn't necessarily respect the way Chuck did things. Because I think we've seen enough in the show that Chuck and Jimmy are very different lawyers. They don't act the same way they don't have the same motivations in regard to the law and i think i don't know if you could ever prove this unless they he says it in the show at some point later down the line i don't know maybe he never does but i'm gonna in my head canon i do feel like there's almost a version of jimmy right now that is like i think there was some influence of the lawyer that he became and is and wants to be that is influenced by chuck and how chuck was and almost wanting to be that but not in the same way and i think the way that jimmy wants to go in helping the person the client is inspired almost in in the sense of like being the anti-chuck because chuck wasn't really that it comes back to all of those emotions that he's been that have been kind of festering since chuck's death in jimmy that, that, that still haven't really it's easy to kind of forget almost been festering since the beginning of season four that he's not really dealt with right and, and i think it's easy for him to kind of be be dealing with all those emotions have those simmering within him you know deep down and almost wanting to like i say be the anti-chuck be as as good as successful as competent but in a way that jimmy perceives to be better i.e looking after the client as opposed to the law and almost maybe like a petty thing of like chuck cared about the law above all else i care about the clients and therefore i am better than him like a little bit of that yeah i'm reaching i am i'm, I'm taking a lot on what i know about jimmy what i know about where he's emotionally what i know about what he's been repressing since chuck's death what i know he's been dealing with since chuck's death and not having 
having that final conversation of having that conversation end the way it did having it being very unresolved feeling pettiness a little bitterness and just the way that he's landed and the way that obviously he's getting his law license back the way that he's talking in the scene i just it makes sense to me that that's what's going on in him like i say even if it's not conscious i think we have everything we need Hmm, I don't know whether going back in is the best play. Okay. What did they decide? She can't tell you that. You gotta be kidding me. No, 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 don't. Oh, no, no, no! Really? Did they reject him? What, what? did I, I do wrong? Mr. Mr. McGill, this okay, is not... Okay, please tell me. Uh, These really? These decisions are never easy. Okay, come on, I deserve an answer. What did he do wrong? Yeah, go on. It was a question of sincerity. They thought he was lying. Really? Some members of the committee found you somewhat... <sighs> insincere. Can't relate. I think he was being honest. You're free to apply again next year. That's... No. No. <laughs> Yeah, valid. Everything, like look, there's a danger of me repeating myself and I, and I fully appreciate that there might be some people watching this video that haven't seen my full analysis of all the show so far. But succinctly, Jimmy, the system, the circumstances, the influence of Chuck, all have conspired to work against, directly against Jimmy in like really unfair ways. And if you want that analysis, go back and watch my other videos. But if you've watched them all so far, you know where I stand on this. And this man has been beaten 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 and there's been very little that he could do and as much as i do see people talking for example in comments and uh, it's not so much anymore but i used to get more comments about jimmy's a man he's an adult and he's making his own decisions and you gotta live by your decisions and, and take the blows if you do something wrong and at face value there's nothing wrong with that comment however again specifically contextually in regard to jimmy it's like this you hear of those experiments all the time right they might use my and they have like cheese at the end of the um, a maze and the various tests they do and the ways that they perhaps manipulate the mouse or whatever it might be or to see how the mice might behave this is maybe an analogy for understanding my thinking on this if you don't come down on my side of this because to me this is how it is and it's why that kind of comment is so untenable as, a, as an opinion like in my opinion I just don't think that's valid because people do that it's almost a get out of jail free card it's like a I don't want to think harder about this so I'm going to just say like Jimmy's making his own decisions and he's a bad person for that and it's like you can do that if you want I do think you're missing a lot of the context though and I do feel like as a result of that it makes your opinion inaccurate so let me again let, let's let's go to the analogy that I think might help you understand perhaps where I'm coming from on this it's like almost if you have a mouse and you have a maze and at a certain point in this maze you have two two branching paths but the whole point of putting the mouse in the maze is to get them to the end of it and the cheese that's the whole experiment so you have a mouse and you have a maze right Right? and you have all of these intricate passages, but the way that the maze is made up, there's only one truly divergent choice. You get two choices at a certain point in the maze and the mouse can decide which way to go. That's the mouse's choice. The mouse gets that choice, right? Two choices. And at face value, it might be like, well, you got two choices. You got two choices. You can go one way or the other way. What the mouse doesn't know is that there's only one end to the maze and that regardless of the either choice that the mouse makes, they'll always end up at that choice. But Tyler, you might say, that's not quite true because why does it have to be that end that the mouse gets to because what you're talking about is disingenuous there are several endings that, that the mouse could get to surely based on the choices that the mouse makes and it's like no because the maze is entirely constructed by people like chuck constricting jimmy's path because what we've seen in the show is incredibly frequently the choice being taken out of jimmy's hands and the choices that he does actually have to make don't matter because the people in power behind the scenes chuck have been influencing him all along. Like the reason that Jimmy is here right now is because he was put in a maze designed by Chuck to only ever get him to one exit. And even if in the midst of that maze, he had a choice to make, it didn't actually matter which one he made. He would only ever have still got to that end of the maze. That one point because of the person that constructed the maze that Jimmy was put into. And it's people like Chuck who were making decisions behind his back without his knowledge. People in power like Chuck, he had a lot of 
of power, a lot of power, basing his decision making on stuff that we know is the audience, that Jimmy was being honest about his desire to be better and make something better of himself. But because Chuck had already decided who he was, he'd already put Jimmy into this maze that was designed to make him fail, depending on whichever decision he might have made, it didn't matter. So it's like, can you understand where it's like as many decisions as he can possibly make, it doesn't actually matter because the ending to that maze isn't good for him because it's a maze that was designed by people like Chuck who, who now is gone. Chuck can't reverse, I mean, if he'd ever have wanted to reverse that, if he'd ever wanted to use his power to take Jimmy out of the maze, put him into another one, a fairer one, he can't because he's dead and he's gone. And I mean, I don't even know if Chuck would have even done that based on who he was and how he felt. And so it's like the people that always talk about like, I mean, I know in Breaking Bad, I talked very empathetically about Jesse and said kind of the same things about Jesse. He was put in situations where he was very manipulated by characters that had a lot of power over him. And I know, for example, very early on in that show, he, he wanted to immediately go against Walter and Walter blackmailed him, right? And it's that idea. It's the choice not mattering, right? When, when characters like Jesse, when characters like Jimmy have the these choices in front of them, it doesn't matter where they go because the maze only ends one way and someone has put characters like Jesse, characters like Jimmy in these mazes. And now as a result of that, Jimmy has no way out regardless of the decisions that he makes. You know? And it's like, we have all this context and it's like, you can stop at that. You can stop at that. But how boring is that? You can say like, he's made his own choices and is a criminal and you can end at that and have a good sleep and, and move on with your day. But that's lazy and it's boring. It's like, you don't want to look at all this other information. Nah, nah, I don't want to look at that, mate. Oh, it makes the decision harder because then I have to factor in that and that. And it's like, Shouldn't you factor that in? Shouldn't you be factoring this and this and this and this and this in? We have all of this information. We are so privileged in the information we have. Do you not think it's morally our duty to examine as much of it as possible to determine how we feel about this person? To me, yeah. You should. And so sorry, I am. I'm getting passionate about it. And, and and I'm not saying that Jimmy's blameless. He has made some questionable decisions even within that maze. Absolutely. And within that maze, he's made decisions that have not made his journey through said maze easier or easier to empathize with because he's made decisions that perhaps it's like, God, why are you not helping yourself? And I just, yeah, yeah. So it's like, I, I watched that scene and I'm like, he's completely valid. Life is beating him down and it's nothing to do with him. And this is so unfair. This is the echo of Chuck. Because like I say, talking about that scene that we had, my reading of that is that he was being honest. At the tail end of it, right? I, I think there was very much a Chuck-esque way that he went into that room with. But I think he dropped that. When she was, when she asked him honestly, it's like, what's your, what, how do you feel about the law? I think there was honesty there. And that's what we just saw was the issue. They thought he was being insincere. And I don't think he was being. And despite that, he was not given what he should have been given a chance at. And, and now look at maybe where that's going to go another year how hard this year's been and now another year and he's not gonna make it you know what i mean and it's like again life beating him down i'll stop talking about it i'm sorry i, I i'm passionate i'm passionate about it and i care about it and i care about the show i like the show and i like jimmy and i, and I just i see a man falling you know I, we know where he's going he's falling and i just lament that that's it i just lament it playing volleyball that guy kind of cheats of course he does. Werner's still talking? Oh, they've been saying goodbye for about 20 minutes now. <laughs> Her back's acting up, so they want to go to the Springs. It's uh, like the usual. Nothing suspicious. Let him go on as long as he wants. Bless him. I'm gonna check the perimeter. I keep waiting for something to happen with this. You good? Okay. Why am I worried? He really wants out. Mate, come on. I want him to get out. Just finish the work. No problem with that language. In uh, <laughs> 15, clause 4B, third paragraph. Oh, it's Kim. Payment, reimbursement. Oh, no. Bless her. It simply gives us the right to indemnification. Oh, no. Which there are none. Oh, this is so painful. He doesn't deserve this. And mm, there's actually a way back for them. This is a way back for them. We've been seeing that. And as much as I was saying it was flimsy, now I'm kind of feeling like it wasn't. And I feel like the show is being like, no, 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 it was genuine. But what is going to make it break again is that he's not going to get his law license back. <sighs> Slow down. Slow down. Oh, no. 
Jimmy, calm down. I get it. He's absolutely valid for feeling this way, but you just got to chill, man. You, I, like, okay, okay, okay. Insincere. I think he's so annoyed because he was being sincere. How do you just Jimmy? prove insincere? Hmm. I was good, Kim. He was. I think it was the Chuck bit. The bit where he was almost channeling Chuck, where he was like talking about the bar journal and he was quoting. It felt rehearsed. But I think all he was doing was like quoting, like not, not quoting Chuck, but like I think he was channeling Chuck because he was like, who are these guys gonna like? Chuck, right? Do you know what I mean? I, I completely get how it was a human response to go there and to like protect yourself almost, to, to have this veneer of Chuck that, that helps you through a situation that you're kind of nervous about and you want to get through. I think it was that part of it. I don't think it was the, the last part. I think the last part actually was the most sincere and actually we saw that the lady like listened to that and was like, I believe that. I think it was the bar journal and when he was quoting that was, it, it felt performative. And I think, cause it was, but not, <laughs> not in an insincere way. Cause I think obviously it came across as insincere to them because it was rehearsed but i think it, he was channeling chuck which is almost insincere but i don't think he was truly insincere he was just trying to get himself through the situation to get his law license back to get to a place where in the honest bit of that interview he was talking about the client the client the client vigorous rigorous arguing with the client and i care about them and this is the most important thing i've ever done i think that was truthful that's what he wanted to get back to and that's why he did it and it wasn't necessarily insincere he, had, he just had this wall of protection in his mind that was going to get him through the situation of like I can just embody Chuck and they'll love it and I think that was what they read as insincere well, all fine and then one of them out of nowhere comes up with this weird question no what does the law mean to you I think they read that as honest and I think it was the other stuff they read as insincere putting out there I think I think that's a big one it's huge and I nailed it you did talked about the meaning of the law yeah and I was humble and I was sincere and I think perhaps it's the contrast of those two things that the way that you presented both of the things because you were Chuck-esque and then you were you and I think there was those were so different that they read that as like well it comes across as insincere because it doesn't all correspond to the same tone do you know what I mean and I think that does give the impression of insincere I, I think they've read it really wrong, but I understand why they've read it that way. What did they say when you talked about Chuck? What does Chuck have to do with this? You didn't even... Why would I? Oh. Okay. And yes, you will appeal. We'll, we'll find a way to make you look sincere. Nice, Kim. I might have been a little corny, but I meant every word. I know that. Yeah, I believe him. And I believe that you she believes believe him. me. No, 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 Jesus, Don't right sabotage, don't face. sabotage, you're sabotaging. Some kind of low life, some kind of... Come on. No, no, not this way. Not this way. That's, yeah, you not... look at me and you see slipping Jimmy. Come on. Said that. Yeah, but you thought it. This is the explosion, the argument, and, it, and it, it, he's emotional right now, and I get it. Want to know why the committee called you insincere? Because you didn't mention Chuck. Also valid. They know what happened, Jimmy. They were waiting for you to say something about him. So I'm supposed... Right. How is that sincere? Yeah, I don't think about Chuck. Yeah, yeah, I agree that. Chuck was alive and now he's dead and that's that. Finito. I believe him. There it is again. And that's why we don't have an office. Yeah, but no, 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 but no, Jimmy, you haven't talked about this with her. So her, her, her reaction to that is, is fair because you've not talked about this and she's given you your space, mate. She's allowed you the space to come to her to talk about it and you've not. So you can't expect her to understand when you just come out with this. I, I get it, right? As the audience watching this and, and this is what I've been saying, I, I, I completely get where he's coming from. And that's where I, my brain's been at is that I, I know that for him, a lot of it is like, it's done and it was horrible and sure, I miss him and I love him but he he was what he was he thought what he thought about me and it's done now and it's that thing of like he didn't know how to react he loved him but he hated where it got to and it was horrible right it was horrible for him I think it's completely valid that he is in a place where he's like it, it it was done and it was that and I moved on and it was fine and that's why I didn't mention it and I think that's fair but again it's the it's the context I, I understand because I've watched the entire show and I've seen all of this I know more about him than Kim does because he's not been talking to Kim about it and so from Kim's perspective looking at him and being like Ooh, that's cold. It's fair. Because she's still not aware of that last conversation they had. Do you know what I mean? Oh, God, it's so beautifully written. It's so beautifully constructed to get to this. Oh, and it is. It's this explosion that I was talking about. The argument that I've been feeling for so long. It's here. Do not start in on that office. I don't want to hear another word. But it's so misunderstood. All of it's misunderstood. If Kim just knew everything and Jimmy knew where she was coming from and, and, and the situation and, and how I saw everything, it'd all be fine. But it's... 
That's not how it is. About that stupid office. Stupid office. Okay, here we go. No, no, no. Don't make it personal. No. On your side since the day we met. Who she comes has. Running when you call. Yeah, she has. I have a job, but I drop everything. She, she does. Every single time you confess to a felony on tape, I'm the mm. bar hearing. I represent you. And over again, if you need me. Um, yeah, she's not the one to take this out on me. But somehow in your mind, the only measure of my feelings for you is, is some office? Yeah, I'm good. Exactly. The, the, the measure of his feeling and his emotions is this professional thing that he's got with her and this office and, 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 and measuring up to her. It's the stuff I've been talking about and she's right and she's bang on the money. She's absolutely right. And, and it's like, this is only coming out. This is only coming out because of this huge hit that he's taken in not getting back as a lawyer. Oh God. Oh, okay. Play it. Just Enough play it. Either. My feelings for you is, is some office? Yeah, she's bang on. Because again, in his mind, he's connecting their relationship to this office and having this office space with her, which is ex exactly what I said, which is unhealthy. And it's coming back to bite me in the bottom because exactly, she's right. And it shouldn't be tied to that. It shouldn't be. It should just be their relationship and how they feel about each other. Somehow in your mind, the only measure of my feet. I'm sorry, I'll get past this line. I swear to God. Yeah, I'm good enough to live with, to sleep with, but God forbid you should have an office. No, stop it. He's, this is very human. He's, he's, he's latching onto this thing that has, I think... <sighs> been like a deep emotional draw for him the office thing which i don't think if this had happened he's lost control of his emotions right now which is fair and valid considering what happened unfortunately now he's letting that rule him and he's taking it out on kim which is like she said the one person that's been there for him the whole time and he's fixating on this thing and he's sabotaging he's self-sabotaging the relationship because of that and it's so human and so horrible you get a little bored with your life so you come down and roll around in the dirt <laughs> Or fun like standing there with a smile plastered on my face while you play infantile it's all coming out infantile mind games on my law partner oh what a mistake it was to take me up to your office mind games on, Sh on coakley yeah to take me up to your office in the sky in, this, you in the sky everything the the whole thing yeah the money the the prestige in the sky right this this oh my god it's everything that i've been talking about coming to a head i hate it i i, I hate it it's beautiful i love it but i hate it this is the culmination yeah maybe i won't and maybe next time you call, I won't come. Mm. Kick him in when he's down. <sighs> Jimmy, you are always down. Oh, no, no. Not you, Kim. I get it. He's, he's, he's hit you. He's hit you a lot there in that conversation. I've... But God damn, that felt like Chuck. The way that she talked to him then. Just, the, just that line. God, this is the culmination. That conversation, that explosion is the culmination of like five episodes building up to it, man. Like all of it, everything that I've been talking about was in that conversation, everything. And it's like, Jimmy doesn't care as much about The Office as he did in this conversation. It's just coming out of him. Like in, in, in those moments where like, I mean, we've all experienced that where like we have these little things that we can, that they're not a big deal. We just let them go. We get on with it because it's not a big deal. It's fine. And you know, you're being a little bit unfair about it in your own head. So it's like, you don't take it out on the person or the people or whatever it is but then you're angry you're having a bad day something snaps you just rubs you up the wrong way and it all comes out and then it looks like a bigger deal than it is and it looks like you've been holding it all in and you care about it all to the highest extent and you don't and you you did the processing and you know you, you're getting over it you're not quite over it you're getting over it but it all comes out and then suddenly the person is like really you were thinking about this all along and it's that it's such a human interaction and it's like jimmy as much as he, he does care about the office thing he doesn't care about it enough to sabotage his relationship with Kim I believe and the only reason is because of obviously the uh, highly strong emotional state he's in right now and it might cost him it might cost him the relationship with Kim that he's just been getting back and I hate it I love it it's beautiful it's great writing and um, the the payoff for it is awesome like <laughs> top marks do you know what i mean as much as i'm in pain <laughs> and i am it's great and i think you're paying off everything they've been building the last several episodes this whole season is paying off there in such beautifully subtle ways it's so human the way it's been written so like i say so organic and it's so beautifully horrible horrible Kim, I think, acted really validly, though. I mean, they both did. Ah, uh, no, Jimmy less so. Jimmy less so, because, he, again, he was just letting himself get dragged down, bogged down in, in the things that he didn't really care about, but just he was looking for stuff to lash out at her with. Where are we at? Damn. Okay. Now we done done now, huh? Yeah, look at this. Look at this shot here. The divide, the barrier between them. Very separate. 
I think she was ready to talk. She was sat there with a beer waiting for him and he just walked past her. The way we saw, was it last episode or the beginning of this episode where I, I was talking about him giving? He was questioning her of like, is it really moral if we do blah, blah, blah? And then she she didn't really answer and he was like, no, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Do you know what I mean? It was this, this like I talked about this foundation of a relationship based on giving in to her whim. That's gone from Jimmy now. She was there ready. He walked past her. That desire from him has just been eradicated. And I think once he actually gets over this and, and cools down a little bit, he'll realize how much he messed up here. Is he packing? Damn. Oh, Kim. I love Kim. I genuinely love Kim. She deserves more than this, mate. Come on. The painful thing about it is he loves her. He really, really does. And his emotions are overwhelming him. Look at her, she's waiting. Talk. Come on. I messed it all up. Beautiful, okay, good. You still wanna be a lawyer? Good question. Yeah. Right. Well, we can start with that. Beautiful. Oh, Kim, I, I, I actually love her so much. Despite all of that, he gave a little bit and she was like, yeah, let's get on that. <sighs> so beautifully played by both of them, by the way. And the, and, the, and the cinematography and the way that it's so close in their face and you can see everything. So, what do we got? Where's Werner? What's going on with sex? What is that? Oh, yeah. Oh, God. Dead pixels. Oh, that's manipulation. Camera flared for about 20 seconds. Werner, gonna, is he made a break for it? Any of the other cameras do that? Yeah, 10. Oh dear. Show me the outside cameras. Damn. If Mike had been here, we'd have clocked this. They've gone. Werner's gone. Get the lights! Or the all gone. Did he start to get suspicious that they were just captured, trapped, imprisoned? Buddy. Buddy. There's a letter, Mike. Oh, what an episode. What a packed episode this has been. This is on mic. This is kind of on mic, mate. This was his jurisdiction. Oh, mate. Mike's gonna come back with a vengeance now. This is personal. What's going on? If it were, Mike. Oh, no, okay. It's just Werner. Right. Werner's clocked out. God damn. Yeah. Mate, Werner, man. Oh, come on. He's not making it out of this show alive. There's no way. Mike, like I say, Mike's, this is personal. This was Mike's mess up. Mike's going to make it right. And Mike's good. You know he is. He's going to track him down. It's going to be... Hey, 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 hey. I forgot, I did. But Mike hasn't killed yet. I don't think. That was very much, that's always been so, in Breaking Bad, he he was very much a killer. Kind of an assassin, a fixer. He did everything, but he would kill and he would go in with a gun. He would kill, do you know what I mean? He's still not that Mike yet in this show. Again, I forgot. He's still not that Mike. We haven't bridged that gap. And as much as I'm talking about Jimmy getting to Saul, Mike is not the Mike we know in Breaking Bad. And I do wonder whether perhaps the thing that throws him over is his first kill is gonna be Werner. I see it going that way. And the way that Werner has behaved, the, the situation where as much as I care about Mike, despite as much as I care about Werner, I get it. I get it. I, I, from a personal perspective, I'd be like, <sighs> do, you know, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, title of the episode, Vida saying, I'm off mate, bye. Boys, you messed up. Come on. I feel like Ver Werner did it at a time when Mike, he knew Mike wasn't going to be there as well. I think there's subtle respect there that he knows, that he knows that if Mike was there, he wouldn't have stood a chance. Yeah. Damn, what a packed episode. What a brilliant episode. So much in it. And I've talked so much. I'm so sorry. But again, I think I'll leave that there. I think I've done everything that I wanted to, uh, said everything that I wanted to, done all the analysis that I think it, it warrants. Brilliant episode. I need to remember the name of it, Vida Sane, because uh, one of the standouts of the show so far, right? Obviously, we've got Chicanery, very much a standout, Vida Sane. Brilliant culmination, I think, of what we've been building up towards the entire season. All of the stuff that I've kind of been 
been like mulling about with, talking about. That's kind of born fruit, I think, this episode. We're talking about with Kim and Jimmy, talking about with Mike, Werner. I think the last couple of episodes, what we've been seeing with him as well. Yeah, super, super interesting. Little note, I think, on Lalo. Tail end of this season, I think Lalo is very much long term going into five and six, right? There's not much you can kind of do with Lalo. You just introduced him. I like that. I do. It's a nice touch, right, to kind of keep things a little bit interesting. Introduce someone who's also charismatic, likable. I don't think they're going to do much with him this season, but I think we're going to take him into season five, season six. So yeah, we'll see. But um, yeah, what an episode. If you're just saying, uh, honestly, one of my favorites of the show uh, so far. So yeah, thank you so much for watching. Um, thank you for your patience. <laughs> this episode. Hey, there are some links down below if you want some early access content. Links in the description. Patreon, YouTube memberships, exactly the same. Thank you to those who do support me. Genuinely, thank you. Thank you so much. You're so cool. And um, with that said, consider watching either of these videos right here if you want to keep the hype train rolling. But other than that, that's it from me. More Better Call Saul coming soon. Have a good week. I'll see you then.